الحمد لله فهو الرحمن الرحيم We say that all praise and all thanksgiving belongs to God because God is the one who has identified God's self as Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, two names which come from a root in Arabic, a root equation, which means the womb of the mother, the uterus. And so much more than mercy, these two names communicate to us how God loves us. With that love that can only be compared in this world to the love of mother, a love that is unconditional, a love that is nurturing, a love that is protective, a love that is always ready to welcome us home if we have the wisdom and the desire to seek home. In alhamdulillah, we praise God and we seek God's forgiveness and we seek refuge in God from the evil tendencies which really do exist within our own hearts and souls. And we seek refuge in God from the destructive tendencies of our actions, even when we ourselves do not intend evil. This would include things like the carbon imprint that we created just in the effort to come here today. We did not come here today without a cost. And so this includes the chocolate we love, or the coffee that I love, or the clothes that we wear, ways that we don't intend to oppress others, and yet we might inadvertently do so. We seek refuge in God from all of that. And in all situations of our lives, we offer God praise. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad and may God's blessings and God's salutations be forever upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad al-Mustafa, God's chosen and God's beloved. The one who has sent Khatma Nabiyyin to affirm and confirm what all the Prophets before him brought and taught. And the one who has sent is nothing illa rahmatan lil alameen. The one who was sent is nothing but a mercy as a token of God's love to everyone and to everything. May God's blessings be upon him. May God's blessings be upon his beloved family members who sacrificed everything for the sake of justice and truth and the defense and rescue of the vulnerable. We ask for God's blessings to be upon all of his righteous and true companions who similarly sacrificed everything so that one day we might inherit this beautiful faith and way of life and carry it on in the world. We ask for God's blessings to be upon all of the messengers. We ask for God's blessings to be upon all of their families and all of their true and righteous companions. And we ask for God's peace and blessings to be upon this land, this beautiful land of Ireland, which I've only ever known in sunshine. <laughs> and upon the world today. For oh God. It would also be wrong for me to begin without speaking a word of thanks to people who are not in this room, but to people whose sacrifice has allowed me and enabled me to be here. And I'm thinking of all of those people who in some way, shape, or form have contributed to my education. I'm thinking of my mother and father, good, believing, pious, church-going Catholics who sacrificed a great deal so that we could study. I think of the Catholic priest who taught me my first courses about Islam. I think of the Jewish teacher in my Catholic high school who taught me my first Arabic with love and taking no remuneration, no payment for that. And I think tonight, or today, of my wife whose sacrifice truly purchases for me the time to be here with you. Five we have, two boys and three girls. One of ours is now at university, but still the other four make up for the absence of the one. And they of course are young children and they have no idea how their own self-centeredness places incredible stress and anxiety upon their mother, who is now managing our home single-handedly. 
And so it would be wrong for me not to acknowledge her and not to acknowledge her sacrifice and not to say very honestly that it is her sacrifice which purchases for me the time to be here with you. So we begin. So imagine a world. Imagine a world where you cannot easily distinguish between what is real and what is false, fake, or fabricated. Imagine a world where you are enticed to enter, you are invited to enter, enticed by convenience, or entertainment, or sports, or pleasure, or anything that you love. You are enticed to enter, and it's so easy to enter, and yet this is a world that makes it very difficult for you to leave. Imagine a world where there are countless unseen watchers who track your every move. Imagine a world where predators lie in wait for you, where evil forces and people are looking for your weaknesses so that they can take advantage of you, exploit you, and manipulate you. Imagine a world where your mistakes are not forgiven, a world where your mistakes are not forgotten. Imagine a world where you are tempted by total freedom to do anything your heart desires, and yet you are endangered of becoming addicted or enslaved to those very things. Imagine a world where people hide behind masks and skins, as they say in the gaming world, and so can pretend to be anyone. Imagine a world where many of your friends are really strangers who might use or misuse your trust to expose your faults and humiliate you rather than doing what real friends do, and that is covering your faults and protecting your dignity. You get the idea. So what advice would you give to someone traveling to such a world? What precautions or safety tips would you recommend to someone traveling to such a place? Today, we're going to ask the question, what does our faith tradition, which reaches back 1,400 years to the revelation of the Qur'an, which we celebrate just in a few days with the coming of the month of the Qur'an, Ramadan, but also a religion which reaches back much earlier, understanding that our faith did not come as a new religion, but came as a call to the return of Milat Ibrahim, the religion of Abraham, salam. So what can a ancient spiritual and religious practice possibly tell us about living in the cyber universe? We cannot undo the cyber universe. We cannot ignore it. But we can learn how to be vigilant and how to protect ourselves. And so today, we're going to be seeking some nasiha, some advice, some guidance from our own religious foundation. Advice that's not just for the youth. It is wrong for us to think that the danger of the internet is only for the youth. The danger is for me, and the danger is for all of us in this room. Because none of us are exempt. None of us are absolutely protected from the dangers which exist there, and the dangers that exist always right here in the heart.
The internet is a little bit then like the cave where Luke Skywalker first experienced the dark side of the Force. Yoda said, the only evil that you will find there is what you take with you. And so one of our greatest enemies in the cyber universe is going to be coming from within our own hearts. So as I think about this, the first term which comes up, and it's a term that, like many of our religious terms, we take for granted and we think we understand, and yet we really don't. How many of us think we know what the word taqwa means in the Qur'an? It often, even this morning, this morning, this word taqwa get, got translated in the reading, which was so beautifully done by my little brother, mashallah, Abdurrahman. But the translation translated taqwa as fear. And maybe there's something of fear in taqwa. But like all words in the Arabic language, and all of my Arabic-speaking brothers and sisters can tell us better than I can, especially our shuyukh in the room. But all, most Arabic words boil down to a three-letter code or a three-letter equation. And the code here is not fear. The code is vigilance. Vigilance. And so this idea of taqwa, when we read in the Quran, taqullaha haqqa tuqati, that, O oh, you who believe, be vigilantly mindful of God to the extent that God deserves to be vigilantly kept in mind. And then we read many other verses about taqwa. This idea of taqwa really in English should be translated more like vigilant mindfulness, about being on one's guard. And we are vigilant, of course, when we know that we are in a state of danger. When we walk into the jungle or we walk into a dangerous city, our senses are awake and we are mindful and vigilant. But this is meant to be our state of being as religious beings. We are meant to be awake. We are meant to be alert. We are meant to walk with a sense of vigilance. And this is not just here or there or in the mosque, but this is at all times, in all places. And somehow the cyber universe feels like it's a world because it's so artificial and it's so compelling with its own sense of reality. Sometimes we feel that our ihsan and our taqwa don't apply there. In the same way that we see sometimes very well-mannered people lose all of their manners when they're inside their car and they're behind the wheel. You know, they're picking their nose or they're yelling, swearing at other drivers or they're... They allow themselves to behave in ways that they would never behave outside of the car because somehow they feel that inside their automobile, none of the rules apply. When it comes to the cyber world, this is not a place for us to let our guard down. This is a place for us to be extra vigilant, extremely vigilant because it is such a dangerous place. And so we have many other words that we use to refer to a similar state of consciousness. And we often forget what these words truly mean. And so in addition to taqwa, of course, we have the word ihsan. And the word ihsan in our traditional vocabulary, it, again, does not get captured by the English term righteousness. But ihsan, again, comes from a root meaning in Arabic, which means beauty. And this wasn't this form of the Arabic verb, من, من أوزان الفعل, from the different forms of the Arabic verb, ahsan yuhsinu al-ihsan, truly means to make something beautiful. 
And so the idea that Ihsan, as we learn in the Hadith of Gabriel, Hadith Jibra'il, the prophetic report where our faith is described to us by our beloved Prophet, والسلام, upon him be blessings and peace. But our faith is described to us in terms of our physical acts of worship, al Islam, the embodied things that we do, al Iman, our rational commitment, our belief in God and in the books and the messengers, as we heard in the khutbah yesterday, and also in Ihsan, this sense of being conscious at all times of God's presence. Al Ihsan then becomes the cultivated consciousness. It doesn't just come naturally. We have to cultivate a consciousness of God's presence, God's ever presence at all times and in all places. And because the human being was created to be a theocentric being, a being that has God in the middle, this is one of the reasons why the mystics of Islam compare the heart, the qalb, to the Kaaba. Right? The Kaaba only works when it is empty of all other idols of worship. And so too the human heart only works when it is its core, its very heart is reserved for God and only for God. And so this idea that when the human being then becomes conscious of God's presence, the human being becomes beautified. And this is truly the way we should think about al-ihsan, is it is the path of beautification. It's what happens to a human being when a human being is mindful and vigilant and conscious of God at all times. So just imagine for a moment how your relationships, your friendships, would be different in a state of ihsan. If you consciously are aware at all times that God is in the room and God is present, imagine how your marriages would be different. Uh, I imagine how my marriage would be different. When we get into our, our little arguments, sometimes big arguments, to be consciously mindful of God's presence. And then today, the question is, is imagine how your surfing habits would change. If you are consciously aware of God's presence. One of the things that Sheikh Hussein said earlier on was part of our faith is the conscious and constructive use of time. No one will ever give us the time back that we've spent playing Candy Crush. No one will ever give us the time spent that we've, or the time that we've squandered playing other games and other amusements. No one will ever give us that time back. And it is not to say that playing is not part of life. Playing is part of life. But no one will ever be able to give us back the hours that we spent staring at the television even long after our mind went to sleep. That somehow it's so easy to turn on and so difficult to turn off. And so these concepts like taqwa and ihsan, these are ancient concepts for us, but they are medicinal even in our current moment, and they are medicinal for the questions, the important questions that we're asking today. So what's one of the first pieces of nasiha that our tradition gives us, and that is ittaqullah, be vigilantly mindful of God, and understand that the cultivated consciousness that is the path of beautification, al-ihsan, this is a non-negotiable part of our faith. It is not enough just to say the prayers, and it is not enough just to have the right aqidah, but we must be committed every day 
to a path of improvement and a path of putting God constantly in the middle of our situation and in the middle of our day. So this is not only about protection, but this is also about our advancement and restoration as human beings. So within the spiritual traditions of Islam, we have other words which come to play and reinforce this sense of mindfulness instead of mindlessness. So in addition to taqwa and ihsan, we have the word muraqaba. And the spiritual scholars of Islam say muraqaba is precisely that. It is precisely the practice, the spiritual practice of being mindful of God's presence at all times and in all places. And then we also have the word muhasaba, which is the constant willingness and practice of holding oneself to account, a constant self-evaluation. We talked about the importance of self-regulation earlier with Cleona, and it was such a wonderful presentation. I was taking notes as fast as I could. Such a wonderfully informative presentation. And one of the elements that she did not know she was teaching is that she already was moving into theology when she talked about the importance of self regulation. As a father, my primary job is to make myself irrelevant. My primary job is to prepare my children for life without me. To help them develop the tools that they will need to live their own life without my guidance, without my support. Because I'm not here for long. And so what we try to give our children are the tools that they will need to become the leaders of the next generation, to become the leaders of their families. And so for me to tyrannically dominate their lives and not to help them develop the tools to handle their own freedom would be for me to limit them from growing. And so this idea of self-regulation, which really should be our goal as we're coaching ourselves and coaching our children to manage this world of the cyber universe and to manage the challenges, the many challenges it brings up, that this idea of self-regulation should be our goal. And the terms muraqaba and muhasaba from our own spiritual tradition, they really come right to that question of self-regulation. Real virtue is what you do when you don't have to. It's what you do when no one is looking. And so this is what we need to prepare ourselves and one another and our young, our youth, for. Now connected to taqwa is the practice of fasting. And we're just about to enter into the blessed month of Ramadan, the month of fasting. And for many of us, it's a month that's really about food and drink. We know that many Muslims gain weight in Ramadan, which is crazy. It's about special foods, it's about celebration. There's a lot for us to celebrate in Ramadan. Most especially, Ramadan is the month of the coming of the Qur'an, the gifting of the Qur'an to us. Ramadan is the month then of God's invitation coming into our mailbox. And Ramadan then becomes the month of responding to God's invitation. This is a beautiful thing. But the Quran says very clearly in Surah Al-Baqarah that, that fasting, kutiba alaykum. So fa fasting is required for us just as it was required for those who came before us. And the purpose is given in order that we might develop taqwa. So we're back. We're back to this idea that it's not just that we are fasting from stuff. And we talked yesterday, well, last night, with the youth. Muhammad is my witness, right? We talked last night with the youth that we're not just fasting from stuff. 
And if we're only fasting from food and drink, Imam Ghazali says that our reward for such a fast is food and is hunger and thirst. It's not a month about food or liquid. Right? The Ramadan has to be a month when we think deeply about fasting. And there's a big part of fasting which is fasting from. So we fast from food and from drink and smoke and other things, but we also fast from our hands doing anything that would be harmful to another human being. We fast with our eyes so that we don't look upon people with anger or lust or envy or anything that would be harmful to them. We fast with our lips so that we don't say any evil or say anything which harms or dehumanizes or attacks the dignity of another human being. We fast with our ears so that we hear no evil. And so Ramadan is the month of turning off the radio when those songs, as we said last night with the youth, some of those songs which are encouraging would say things that are not entirely harmonious with our faith. Come on. And fasting, of course, on the internet should then be something we think about as we prepare for Ramadan. Fasting with our eyes and with our ears and with our mouths so that we don't go places where we really know we should not be. Places that are not good for us and places that may not be good for the people that we're looking at. <coughs> and so fasting then is about taqwa. It's a mechanism by which we cultivate this sense of vigilance, this sense of our responsibilities to God and to one another. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said that fasting is like a shield, Jannah. Right? It's here for our own protection and well-being. In the same way that the Quran says that, you know, we all have our national dress and we all love our clothes and our textiles. And sometimes, you know, uh, we, we uh, get really extravagant with regard to our robes and our, our clothes, and that's all fine. But the Quran says that the true clothes of a, of a Muslim is libas of taqwa. The libas of taqwa, the putting on as your garment taqwa, this idea of vigilant mindfulness. That these are the real clothes of our home world, where we came from, and where we're journeying back to is libas of taqwa, right? the clothing of taqwa, which means that taqwa becomes then part of the raiment that beautifies us and protects us. Now another gift that we are given, it's very hard for me to think when the adhan is coming, so I'm just going to allow the Adhan to speak for a moment.
have to forgive me because uh, since my very first experience of Islam when I was 17 and Catholic and on the streets of Cairo, since the very first time I heard the Adhan, when the Adhan came I could think of nothing else. And so it has always been impossible for me to try to speak when the Adhan comes or to speak over the Adhan. And so uh, uh, I know that this takes away a little bit from our time, but uh, there's, for me there's no uh, way I can do it differently. Now, what is just a procedural question, what is the, the, the normal sunnah of the masjid here for the, uh, the space, the timing between the first Adhan and the Iqamah for prayer? Ten to two. How, many, how much time do we have? Ten to two. Ten to two. Okay. So, my watch is still on Toronto time, so that means that we have about 20 minutes, is that yes? Yeah. Okay, inshallah. Okay. So we'll try to move quickly, inshallah, but I, I'll try not to miss anything uh, that's essential. But another gift that we have, we've talked about taqwa and ihsan and muhasaba and muraqaba, these notions that are all connected, right, to the idea of, of being vigilant and being mindful and walking a path of constant improvement and walking a path of, of mindfulness of God's ever-presence. There is no place... Good. So I have 10 minutes. So there, there is no place where God is not. Even my little boy asked me, the one who is in the UK studying now, he asked me, he says, oh, so God is everywhere, right? And I said, well, yes. He said, so that means God's in hell too, right? And no one had ever said that to me before. And I said, well, I guess so. And so if you were in the fire, but you were aware that God was with you, then the fire would have no power anymore, would it? And so the idea here that the cultivation of, of this sense of divine ever-presence is so critically important. So this is one of the great medicinal protective gifts that our traditional faith gives us as we journey into this dangerous world of the cyber universe. Because the cyber universe is not a place where these things stop or cease being relevant. It is not a place that can bar God's presence. And so we must be mindful of carrying all of those same qualities into that world that we carry with us here. Now another gift that comes up in the presentation that Cleona gave to us is this idea of community. This idea we are given one another as a great gift, as an aid. There's a beautiful Sufi poem, a story, called Monte Patayr, the Conference of the Birds, that comes from the 13th century. And one of the things, it's all about the spiritual journey to God. And one of the things that occurs in the opening of that book is all the birds gather. And the chief bird, who was the bird of Solomon, is speaking. And the bird of Solomon says, I know the way to our king, but I cannot go alone. And so he's asking the birds to join him on this journey to God, this journey to Allah. And this is so true for us, and this was also brought up this morning in Sheikh Hussein's presentation is that we are social beings. We need one another. We cannot achieve our own improvement and perfection without one another. Students need teachers, and teachers need students. We need one another to piece together all of the essential elements of our life and it is in our state of community that we are refined, that we are perfected, 
that we are corrected if we're doing something wrong. And this is the great gift of Ummah, it's the great gift of Shura, it's the great gift that our faith gives to us. I originally come from a country, the United States, that is deeply troubled by race relations. Where the lines of wealth, and al-fuqara, poverty, the, these lines between wealth and poverty often fall along lines of race, white and black. With brown people in the middle, and a little bit here and a little bit there. But even in a city like Chicago, which suffers extremely from these lines, go to a mosque. And in the mosque you will have white and brown and black and Asian. Everybody is together as sisters and brothers before God. And this is one of the, one of the beautiful gifts that our, our concept of Ummah gives us. The problem for us, however, is that we step into the Ummah, sometimes we step into the Masjid, and we are as dishonest as sometimes we are when we're in the cyber universe. We pretend we're strong, we pretend we're perfect, we pretend that we're not struggling with anything. And we come and we say our prayer and everybody sees us, no, mashallah, what a pious brother, what a pious sister, mashallah, mashallah. You go home and you're, you're left unchanged. If we're going to be a real community, we have to remember that vulnerability, weakness, is part of our condition and it's part of what we celebrate as a faith community. It is not in our strength that God is magnified and glorified. It is in our weakness. Think of Maryam, السلام, the one who brought the revelation, God's word, Isa bin Maryam, السلام, into the world. She was a teenage Middle Eastern Jewish girl who was not married. Vulnerable. Think of Zakaria in the temple. السلام, think of how he prayed. He's an old man. He has no children. He's vulnerable. He's poor. He's lonely. It is in his weakness that God's power becomes magnified. <coughs> think of Yusuf السلام, who was thrown into the well and then sold into slavery and then falsely accused of rape or attempted rape and goes to prison, he was completely vulnerable. And think of our own beloved Mustafa والسلام, who was ridiculed by his family, who was, who was threatened in every way and eventually had to leave his beloved hometown of Mecca to seek a safe refuge somewhere else. These are all vulnerable people. And it is in their awareness that by themselves, nothing could happen. And so it is God's power in that weakness, in that vulnerability that we celebrate. And yet somehow, we think that in order to be religious people, we have to be strong. We have to pretend that we have it all together. Whereas the fact is, is that the moment I acknowledge my brokenness, and the moment I invite Allah's perfection to come into my imperfection, that's the moment that I become healed. So it's not, this is not a religion of super athletes. And the month of Ramadan is not a month of becoming a, a religious triathlete. It's a month of acknowledging our poverty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allowing His, and we say His, of course, metaphorically, because in Arabic, the he and the she are only two options. But the idea of allowing God's strength and perfection to fill our own broken places. And that's when we become beautified as human beings. And so if we acknowledge this, then it means that we can begin to live as a real family. Which means that you can begin to come to me and say, you know, brother, I messed up. Brother, I'm broken. Brother, I'm struggling with this. Brother, I'm struggling with this internet addiction. Brother, I'm, 
The moment we can begin to accept that imperfection in each other and let God be the judge, we're not judging each other, but to accept one another and say, okay, so now we know the problem and so now we can begin working on its solution. We go to the doctor and we're saying, doctor, I'm sick. Somehow that doesn't bother us. But when, when it comes to our hearts, and Imam Ghazali says that really the scholars, he says, ulama al-akhirah, the scholars of the next world are what he called the atiba al the doctors of hearts, the spiritual cardiologists. If we're not able to come to one another and to say, brother, I need your help because I'm really struggling with this, right? If, I, if we're not able to do that, then we are preventing or we're putting in place an obstacle to our own spiritual growth. We have to be willing, we have to be courageous enough to acknowledge that before Allah we are poor and we are broken and we all are in need of becoming transformed. And this is one of the reasons why Islam for me is not a membership, it's not a fact of my life. Islam is that force in my life which is which represents the horizon that I'm trying to get to. Islam then becomes the process of me trying to become, and a Muslim is what I aspire to become, someone who is truly in a state, in a state of harmony with God, in a state of harmony with the creation, a state of harmony with my brothers and sisters, and that means that every day, this is not a membership for me, that every day and every moment, this is a challenge. Am I going to give this moment to God or am I going to take it from me? <coughs> and so the moment we begin to think about Islam now as a moment-to-moment -moment choice, a choice we make with every breath and with every moment in this world and in the cyber world, this is the moment then that we begin to walk a path of continuing perfection. And so today I do not speak to you as a scholar, I do not speak to you as a professor, I speak to you as a brother who is in the trenches like you, struggling to become the person that God calls me to be. A Muslim. A real Muslim. Someone who wears libas al taqwa Someone who is beautified by the continuing remembrance of God. And someone who seeks, who loves for my brothers and my sisters what I love for myself. There is no human being who is not here in this world because God made a mistake. And that includes every man or woman or child on the internet. And one of the beautiful teachings of our faith is that these are our brothers and our sisters. Each of them is alive because God breathed the ruh into that human form and brought it into being on purpose. So there is no human being who can be reduced to being an object of my pleasure, an object of my ownership, an object of my entertainment. Every human being is sacred. Every human being is alive because God brought that being into life. And so when we're in the cyber world, just as when we're in this world, we need to be deeply conscious of all of these teachings. And if we, if we are, then we begin to walk in that world the way we walk in this world, or at least the way that God invites us to walk in this world. That is to walk humbly, to walk with mindful vigilance and to understand that our beautification happens there in the cyber universe just as it happens here. And there are beautifying things to seek in that world just as there are here. But we have to seek it. And we have to turn our eyes from those things which strip us of our beauty and pull us from the light back into the darknesses. Because the darkness and the light are in all parts of creation. And it's very clear in the Quran that all of the books and all of the messengers were sent to bring us out of the darknesses of the Lumat and into the light. And so God and the Quran call us to that which gives life, not to that which gives death. 
or that takes life away. And the prophet was sent as a token of love and mercy to everyone and to everything. And if we want to be part of that sunnah, if we want to walk in his way, then that has to be our goal, to be a mercy in this world and in the cyber world. It's time for wudu and prayer, and so forgive me for making this longer than perhaps it should be. But uh, may God forgive me if I've said anything wrong. And I trust you as my sisters and brothers to bring it to my attention if I've said something which is harmful or offensive in any way. And know that we are in this together, and we know the way. We've been given the teachings, we've been given the knowledge of the goal. But we can't go alone. And so, may God guide you and guide our message.